Hey church, this is Vince Miller. Thank you so much for joining me for some more time in God's Word. Now we're going to take a little break from the Gospel of John. Uh, we're going to jump into a short series. I don't know how long. I'll probably take a few days, or maybe a week or longer, looking at some of the events that are happening over in Israel and this territory or strip of land we know as Gaza. Now I want to do this because sometimes we can get really worked up about some things we see and hear happening in, in politics, in media, in our time, uh, whether it be philosophies or ideologies that get us worked up. We sometimes fail to take a hard look at God's word and what his word says. We need a biblical understanding of what's happening over there so we can understand how to respond spiritually. So we're going to chase this little territory over there called Gaza through the Bible from the beginning pages of the Bible into the New Testament and see what God shows us about this place and this land so that we can understand how to spiritually respond to what we see happening in our world today. So we're going to turn to the first page of the Bible, actually. Genesis chapter 10 is the first occurrence of Gaza in the Bible, and it reads this way, and the territory of the Canaanites, so that's their land, Canaan's land, extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza, and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, which are towns you probably have heard of before, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zebulim, and as far as Lasha. So, First, let's step back and look at Genesis chapter 10. What, what is, what, what's happening in Genesis chapter 10? Well, Genesis 10 is a, a genealogical roadmap. The chapter is often called the Table of Nations because it catalogs the spread of humanity after the flood. Now, to you, it's just going to look like a list of names and lineages, but I want you to know that it's way more than that. It details how Noah's population branched out from his three sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem, fulfilling the command that God gave them in Genesis 9 to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And if you choose to read the whole of the chapter, which I hope you'll at least skim it, you're going to notice all these geographical markers, these social groupings, and then a few other historical details that are very important to the people in the nation of Israel. And focusing in on that middle section of the chapter, you're going to find the lineage of Ham. It tells us that Ham had four sons, one of whom was Canaan, who had 11 descendants that we know as the Canaanites that dispersed into, verse 19, the territory of the Canaanites, extending as far as Gaza, so the territory of Gaza. So why, why is this important right here? What's the significance? We learn from this, from the first chapters of the Bible, that God wanted his people to populate this specific land. They were the first to inhabit this territory, including Gaza, which means that they are the indigenous people of Israel and Gaza. And if you jump ahead in the story, keep reading the narrative, you're going to see an inclusion here that was later reinforced when Gaza was listed among Judah's promised territories by God. Now, God's people understood and had a very special understanding of this land. You see, to them, the land, the promised land, this land that they're occupying here in Genesis chapter 10, signified something unique to them. It wasn't just about the dirt or the property lines. It, it described Israel's unique relationship with God, and the land was a territory where God drew close to his people. It was this daily concrete reminder of God's promises to them. The existence of nation as a, uh, Israel as a nation and even the promise of this land grounded them in promises that were made by God. But uh, sad part of the story, if you continue to read the story of the people of God, you're going to realize that God is faithful, but his people are not. And eventually, over hundreds of years, they lose possession of the land because of their unfaithfulness permanently. So why is this important? Well, because this past promise of the land of Israel to God's people doesn't necessarily validate any kind of contemporary claims to the land. But note this, the Jews have reoccupied this land after 1948, which is a special blessing to them. And I'm so glad that those events have happened. But we can't deny that God's divine Old Testament promises were conditional on Israel, keeping 
It's part of their covenant with God. And they proved in the Old Testament to be repetitively unfaithful to the covenant, especially when we encounter the matter of Jesus as the Messiah. So we can't really use a bunch of historical or theological claims to justify any kind of present day right to this land. The land was actually lost and the promise was broken because of Israel's disobedience. Yet today, the Jews are now occupying this land and I am grateful for that. So let me add a small contemporary caveat to this whole discussion today. Present day Israel has a right to defend itself against evil and the events that have transpired over the last few weeks are acts of evil. Now, some people in government and politics and even media are never going to address the issue of evil. They won't even mention the word. Their minds can't even conceive it. They'll try to assume evil away as if there's only different perspectives. There's a Palestinian perspective and an Israeli perspective. There's an, a, spec, a perspective of Iran and a, a, a perspective in Lebanon. And you're never gonna hear them talk about evil. So they're gonna use language to dance around this subject matter, language like proportionality. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to avoid dressing the matter of sin and the problem of evil because they don't want to admit it exists. And the problem with this idea is this, is that some groups like Hamas don't believe in proportionality because they do believe in good and evil. They only believe in complete and total destruction of their enemies because they see themselves as good and their opponents at evil. Hamas is not going to stop if Israel doesn't take measures to protect and preserve itself as far as possible. But if evil exists, it drives us to the core of the issue. And the core of the issue is this, it's sin. The sin that resides in a man's heart. So here's the point. A people possessing and residing on a piece of land are not gonna fix the matter of evil that lies within our heart. Sin will only perpetuate again and again and again to the next generation. The only resolution is God possessing and residing in the prime real estate and territory of a man's heart. This is where the battle is fought. Therefore, this should be our prayer for the people in this region. Pray that God would stop the progression of evil and do a great work in the hearts of sinful men across Gaza, Lebanon, Iran, and Israel. The territory that God is actually concerned about is the soil of our hearts. I love you, fellas. I pray this has blessed you. If it has, share it with someone else, and I'll see you right back here again tomorrow.